and we start today with another letter. This one to Mr. Joseph Beretti at Milan. London, July 20th, 1762. Sir, however justly you may accuse me for want of punctuality in correspondence, I am not so far lost in negligence so as to admit the opportunity of writing to you, which Mr. Beauclerk, or Beauclerk, passage through Milan affords me. I suppose you receive the idlers, and I intend that you shall soon receive Shakespeare, that you may explain his works to the ladies of Italy, and tell them the story of the editor, among the other strange narratives with which your long residence in this unknown region has supplied you. As you have now been long away, I suppose your curiosity may paint for some news of your old friends. May pant for some news of your old friends. Maybe I should put this light on. <clears throat> um, where was I? Ah. Miss Williams and I live much as we did. Miss Cotterall still continues to cling to Mrs. Porter. And Charlotte is still is now big of the fourth child. Mr. Reynolds gets 6000 a year. Levitt is lately married, not without much suspicion that he has been wretchedly cheated in his match. Ooh. Mr. Chambers is gone this day, for the first time the circuit with the judges. Mr. Richardson is dead of an apoplexy, and his second daughter has married a merchant. My vanity, or my kindness, makes me flatter myself that you would rather hear of me than of those whom I have mentioned. But of myself I have very little which I care to tell. Last winter I went down to my native town, where I found the streets much narrower and shorter than I thought I had left them, inhabited by a new race of people to whom I was very little known. My playfellows were grown old and forced me to suspect that I was no longer young. My only remaining friend has changed his principles and was become the tool of the predominant faction. My daughter-in-law, from whom I expected most and whom I met with sincere benevolence, has lost the beauty, beauty and gaiety of youth without having gained much of the wisdom of age. Ouch. I wandered about for five days and took the first convenient opportunity of returning to a place where, if there is not much happiness, there is at least such a diversity of good and evil that slight vexations do not fix upon the heart. Footnote from Boswell. This is a very just account of the relief which London affords to melancholy minds. <clears throat> Back to the letter. I think in a few weeks to try another exertion. Though to what end? Let me know, my Beretti, what has been the result of your return to your own country, whether time has made any alteration for the better, and whether, when the first raptures of its salutation were over, you did not find your thoughts confessed their disappointment. Moral sentences appear ostentatious and tumid, when they have no greater occasions than the journey of a wit to his own town. Yet such pleasures and such pains make up the general mass of life, and as nothing is little to him that feels it in with great sensibility, a mind able to see common incidences in their real state is disposed by other common incidents to very serious contemplations. Let us trust that a time will come when the present moment shall be no longer irksome, where we shall not borrow all our happiness from hope, which at last is to end in disappointment. I beg that you will show Mr. Beauclerk all the civilities which you have in your power, for he has always been kind to me. 
I have lately seen Mr. St Stratico, professor of Padua, who has told me of your quarrel with an abbot of the Celestine order, but is not the particulars very ready in his memory. When you write to Mr. Marsili, let him know that I remember him with kindness. May you, Mr. Beretti, be very happy at Milan, or some other place nearer to Sir, your most affectionate, humble servant, Sam Johnson. <clears throat> the ascension of George III to the throne of these kingdoms opened a new and brighter prospect of men to men of literary merit who had been honored with no mark of royal favor in the preceding reign. His present majesty's education in this country, as well as his taste and beneficence, prompted him to be the patron of science and the arts. And early this year, Johnson, having been represented to him as a very learned and good man, without any certain provision, his majesty was pleased to grant him a pension of 300 pounds a year. Not bad. The Earl of Butte, who was then Prime Minister, had the honor to announce this instance of his sovereign's bounty, concerning which Many and various stories, all equally erroneous, have been propagated, maliciously representing it as a political bribe to Johnson to desert his avowed principles and become the tool of a government which he held to be founded in insurption. insurpation. I have taken care to have it in my power to refute them from the most authentic information. Lord Butte told me that Mr. Wendenbird Burn, now Lord Lowborough, was the person who first mentioned this subject to him. Lord Lowborough told me that the pension was granted to Johnson solely as the reward of his literary merit, without any stipulation whatever, or even tacit understanding that he should write for administration. His lordship added that he was confident the political tracts which Johnson afterwards did write, as they were entirely consonant with his own opinions, would have been written by him, though no pension had been granted to him. Mr. Thomas Sheridan and Mr. Murphy, who then lived a good deal both with him and Mr. Wenenburn. I think when he says lived with, he means hung out with. Told me that they previously talked with Johnson upon this matter and that it was perfectly understood by all parties that the pension was merely honorary. Sir Joshua Reynolds told me that Johnson called on him after His Majesty's intention had been notified to him, and said he wished to consult his friends as to the propriety of his accepting this mark of the royal favor, after the definitions which he had given in his dictionary of pension and pensioners. <laughs> he said he would not have Sir Joshua answered till next day when he would call again and desired he might think of it. Sir Joshua answered that he was clear to give his opinion then, that there could be no objection to his recovering from the king a reward for literary merit, and that certainly the definitions in his dictionary were not applicable to him. Johnson, it should seem, was satisfied, for he did not call again till he had accepted the pension and had waited on Lord Bute to thank him. He then told Sir Joshua that Lord Bute said to him expressly, It is not given you for anything you are to do before what you have done. His lordship, he said, behaved in the handsomest manner. He repeated the words twice that he might be sure Johnson heard them, and thus set his mind perfectly at ease. This nobleman, who had who has been so virulently, virulently abused, acted with great honor in this instance and displayed a mind truly liberal. A minister of a more narrow and selfish disposition would have availed himself of such an opportunity to fix an implied obligation on a man of Johnson's powerful talents to give him his support. Mr. Murphy... And the late Mr. Sheridan severally contended for the distinction of having been the first who mentioned to Mr. Wendenburn that Johnson ought to have a pension. 
When I spoke of this to Lord Lowborough, wishing to know if he recollected the prime mover of the business, he said, all his friends assisted. And when I told him that Mr. Sheridan strenuously asserted his claim to it, his lordship said, he rang the bell. And it is but just to add that Mr. Sheridan told me that when he communicated to Dr. Johnson that a pension was to be granted him, he replied in a fervor of gratitude, the English language does not afford me terms adequate to my feelings on this occasion. I must have recourse to the French. I am penetré with his majesty's goodness. When I repeated this to Dr. Johnson, he did not contradict it. His definitions of pension and pensioner, partly founded on the satirical verse of Pope, which he quotes, may be generally true. And yet everybody must allow that there may be, and have been, instances of pensions given and received upon liberal and honorable terms. Thus, then, it is clear that there was nothing inconsistent or humiliating in Johnson's accepting of a pension so unconditionally and so honorably offered to him. Now, don't you think this would be a nice time for them to have a little footnote that tells us what those definitions were in Johnson's dictionary? But no, we don't get that footnote. We get all these other dumb footnotes that aren't very helpful. Anyway... But I shall not detain my readers longer by any words of my own on a subject of which I am happily enabled by the favor of the Earl of Butte to present them with what Johnson himself wrote, his lordship having been pleased to communicate to me a copy of the following letter to his later father, to his late father, which does great honor both to the writer and to the noble person to whom it is addressed. <clears throat> To the Right Honorable the Earl of Butte, My Lord, when the bills were yesterday delivered to me by Mr. Wendenbird, I was informed by him of the future favors which His Majesty has, by your Lordship's recommendation, been induced to intend for me. Bounty always receives part of its value from the manner in which it is bestowed. Your Lordship's kindness includes every circumstance that can gratify delicacy or enforce obligation. You have conferred your favors on a man who has neither alliance nor interest, who has not merited them by services, nor courted them by officiousness. You have spared him the shame of solicitation and the anxiety of suspense. What has been thus elegantly given will, I hope, not be reproachfully enjoyed. I shall endeavor to give your lordship the only recompense which generosity desires, the gratification of finding that your beliefs are not improperly bestowed. I am, my lord, your lordship's most obliged, most obedient, and most humble servant, July 20th, 1762, Sam Johnson. This year, his friend Sir Joshua Reynolds paid a visit of some weeks to his native country, Devonshire, in which he was, county rather, in which he was accompanied by Johnson, who was much pleased with his jaunt and declared he had derived from it a great accession of new ideas. He was entertained at the seats of several noblemen and gentlemen in the west of England. And in one of these seats, Mr. Dr. Amyot, physician in London, told me he happened to meet him. In order to amuse him till dinner should be ready, he was taken out to walk in the garden. The master of the house, thinking it proper to introduce something scientific into the conversation, addressed him thus. Are you a botanist, Dr. Johnson? No, sir, answered Johnson. I am not a botanist, and, alluding no doubt to his near-sightedness, should I wish to become a botanist, I must first turn myself into a reptile. <laughs> anyway, so he went on these uh, visits, entertained at the seats of several noblemen and gentlemen in the west of England. But the greatest part of the time was passed at Plymouth, where the magnific- magnificence of the navy, the shipbuilding in all its circumstances, afforded him a grand subject of contemplation. The commissioner of the dockyard, Sir Frederick Rogers, 
paid him the compliment of ordering the yacht to convey him and his friends to the Eddy Stone, to which they accordingly sailed. But the weather was so temptuous, temptuous that they could not, tempestuous rather, that they could not land. Reynolds and he were at this time the guests of Mr. Uh, Dr. Mudge. Dr. Mudge, the celebrated surgeon and now physician of that place, not more distinguished for quickness of parts and variety of knowledge, quickness of parts, then loved and esteemed for his amiable manners. And here, Johnson formed an acquaintance with Dr. Mudge's father, that very eminent divine, the Reverend Zachariah Mudge, prebendary of Exeter, who was idolized in the West, both for his excellence as a preacher and the uniform, perfect propriety of his private conduct. He preached in his sermon purposely that Johnson might hear him, and we shall see afterwards that Johnson honored his memory by drawing his character. While Johnson was at Plymouth, he saw a great many of its inhabitants, and was not sparing of his very entertaining conversation. It was here that he made this frank and truly original confession that ignorance, pure ignorance, was the cause of a wrong definition in his dictionary of the word pastern. To that, to the no small surprise of the lady who put the question to him. Uh, yes, that came earlier in this book, you'll recall. Who, having the most profound reverence for his character, so as almost to suppose him endowed with infallibility, expected to hear an explanation of what, to be sure, seemed strange to a common reader, drawn from some deep-learned source with which she was unacquainted. Sir Joshua Reynolds, to whom I was obliged for my information concerning this excursion, mentions a very characteristical anecdote of Johnson while at Plymouth. Having observed that in consequence of the dockyard, a new town had arisen about two miles off as a rival to the old, and knowing from his sagacity and just observation of human nature that it is certain if a man hates us all, hates at all, he will hate his next-door neighbor, he concluded that this new and rising town could not but excite the envy and jealousy of the old, in which conjecture he was very soon confirmed. He therefore set himself resolutely on the side of the old town, the established town, in which his lot was cast, considering it as a kind of duty to stand by it. Uh, he accordingly, I, I think we're talking about um, Sir Joshua Reynolds here, but it's not clear. He accordingly entered warmly into its interests, and upon every occasion talked of the dockers, of the inhabitants of the new town were called, as the inhabitants of the new town were called, as upstarts and aliens. Plymouth is very plentifully supplied with water by a river brought into it from a great distance, which is so abundant that it runs to waste in the town. The dock, or new town, being totally destitute of water, petitioned Plymouth that a small portion of the conduit might be permitted to go to them, and this was now under consideration. Johnson, affecting to entertain the passion of the place, was violent in oppression, opposition. So I guess we were talking about Johnson before. And, half laughing at himself with his pretended zeal where he had no concern, exclaimed, No, no, I am against the Dockers. I am a Plymouth man. Rogues, let them die of thirst. They shall not have a drop. Lord McCartney obligingly favored me with a copy of the following letter in his own handwriting from the original, which was found by the present Earl of Butte among his father's papers. To the Lord, to the right honorable, the Earl of Butte. My Lord, the generosity by which I was recommended to the favor of his majesty will not be offended at a solicitation necessary to make that favor permanent and effectual. The pension appointed to be paid me at Michaelmas I have not received, and know not where or from whom I am to ask it. 
I beg, therefore, that your lordship will be pleased to supply Mr. Wedderburn with such directions as may be necessary, which I believe his friendship will make him think it not no trouble to convey to me. To interrupt your lordship at a time like this, with such petty difficulties, is improper and unseasonable. But your knowledge of the world has long since taught you that every man's affairs, however little, are important to himself. Every man hopes that he shall escape neglect, and with reason may every man, whose vices do not preclude his claim, expect favor from that beneficence which has been extended to my lord, your lordship's most obliged and most humble servant, Temple Lane, November 3rd, 1762, Sam Johnson. All right, so Sam Johnson got a little grant money. That's nice. That should do him well, huh? All he had to do was write a big dictionary and be a guy who writes these long letters. Really? Well, I'm sure he's done other stuff. And write that opinion piece on that uh, bridge. Yeah, and he's done other stuff, I guess. So, good for him. Anyway, we'll uh, start off tomorrow with another letter to uh, Beretti. That was my favorite parts relate to them. Till next time, bye from Boswell.